Hello and welcome everyone to our webcast on how to solve the data challenge for autonomous driving. My name is Dominic Friedel. I am business development manager at NTT Global Data Centers and I have the pleasure to be your host today. Together with our partners B+, IBM, Incenda AI and Lenovo, we would like to provide you some valuable insights about this topic and especially about our project that we have built up over the last few months. And we will um, provide you these insights in the next 60 minutes. And to start right away, let me give you very quick a brief overview of what we do at NTT. So NTT is a Japanese telecommunications company and known as one of the leading ICT service providers worldwide and our portfolio spans from ICT infrastructure, such as co-location data centers, connectivity systems, including submarine cables, uh, also network systems and uh, cloud. And uh, it also includes services like consulting, technical services, managed services and support. Um, and especially it's going into industry re related expertise like uh, for example, intelligent business, intelligent workplace, intelligent cybersecurity, and intelligent infrastructure. And as I am personally part of the Global Data Centers Division, I'd like to give you a slightly deeper insight uh, into what we mean when we talk about Global Data Centers. So we were formerly known as eShelter, and uh, together with our NTT Global Data Centers Group, we provide more than 160 data centers in more than 20 different countries. And uh, this means that we provide the space, the power, the cooling, the connectivity, as well as the security for the IT systems of our customers. And we also provide the direct access uh, to all the major cloud providers, to all the major internet exchanges, as well as to all the major um, internet service providers. And uh, yeah, with our technology experience lab, we have built a platform where clients can test and validate new technology solutions within a productive environment in our data centers. And uh, as we focus with our lab on cutting edge technologies and how they can be applied uh, in different industries, today we have a closer look on the, um, on the automotive industry and how we can enable autonomous driving. So when we talk about the mobility disruption, there is clearly one uh, perspective on the market and that is that the future of mobility will be electrified, shared, connected, as well as autonomous. And this autonomous is a very important trend. So um, I have one number with me, uh, which says that by 2050, up to 45% of all vehicles will drive fully autonomously. But there are quite a few challenges and probably the biggest challenge uh, in the market is the data challenge. So the training of the ADAS, so the advanced driver assistance system requires more data than a vehicle could transfer wirelessly. So the data really needs to be transferred to the, to the data center uh, to make it uh, more uh, yeah, rich, to make it uh, analyzed and to provide it again to the cars themselves. And so to describe it in more detail, uh, in order to develop autonomous driving functions, data from real driving tests is needed throughout the entire development process. And huge amounts uh, of, of aut uh, autonomous test fleets are driving around to collect real environment data via versatile sensors like cameras, like radars and like gliders. And the collected data, which is about 120 terabytes per vehicle per day, must be transferred to the data center for analytics enrichment and for further use so that the car can uh, then also use again for the autonomous cars. And this process of collecting, transferring, processing and storing the data requires a complex chain of co technologies from different providers. And that's why we um, look, had a closer look on, on this process and build it up in our lab. So, we call this project the data garage and uh, together with our partners that I mentioned before, we've built this up. So 
B plus is, for example, providing uh, the recording technologies. IBM is providing the storage solutions. Intenda AI is providing the AI software. Lenovo provides the IT hardware. And we, as the NTT Global Data Centers Group, we provide the data centers. And now we can have a closer look on the data garage concept itself. So it all starts on the street uh, where uh, the data is recorded by test fleets that are driving around and collecting the real environment data. Then the data needs to be offloaded from the car. So um, the offloading um, is basically then done to the data center via copy stations. And then the data has to be stored inside the data center. So um, via a big object storage, the data will be saved um, in the systems. And then the data also needs to be um, yeah, enriched and there has to be a data quality assurance. So there will be uh, data processing made by AI. And at the end, the data also has to be uploaded and stored inside the cloud so that it can be accessible um, to all the um, yeah, stakeholders and all the um, OEMs and data manufacturers, uh, car manufacturers uh, that need the data actually. And as I said, we have built this process already up. Um, on the one hand side, sure, they're driving uh, around cars on the road, but it, on the other side, all the systems that are needed from transferring, storing and analyzing the data is built up in our technology experience lab in Frankfurt that is um, embedded in our NTT global data centers. <laughs> and uh, when I talk about data centers, we see the data centers as one of the core foundations uh, for mobility data. So there are quite some requirements on technical, uh, yeah, on the technical side, as well as on the business side. So uh, technology wise, at first, you need to calculate a huge data growth. So you need flexible and scalable environments. Then you also um, will need to have hybrid cloud environments to uh, store your data at the one hand side in a private and on the other hand side on a public cloud. And so you also require low latency interconnections and direct access to the cloud. And also for AI and analytics, a high power density and strong cooling is required. On the business side, um, we also need 24 seven business continuity to really make sure that critical applications will run continuously. Also security is a big point, which means that a mobility providers registration require IT compliance. So this also includes physical security. And in terms of regulations, there are also some IT processes that require certifications aligned to, for example, the ISO norm. And when we talk about data centers, um, we have yeah, quite a very specific image of that um, because our data centers are quite big. big um, a lot of people cannot imagine the size of our data centers. So um, these are pictures from our data center in Frankfurt. Um, it's the biggest data center campus on, uh, in Europe. And um, yeah, our customers um, are basically, or have a lot of space to deploy their systems within our buildings. So to get to uh, this project today, I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, it's on the one hand side, Alexander Noack from B+. It is Frank Krämer from IBM. It's uh, Florian Netter from Incenda AI and also Carsten Kutzer from Lenovo. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to their talks. And uh, if you're interested, please ask your questions in the chat so I can bring them up in the end to the relevant speakers. Um, please also connect to us for a live test so we can really engage and do a proof of concept inside our data center. And um, we have for sure also provided all the content uh, up to one document. So we have uh, written a white paper over the last few months uh, to provide you uh, all the insights in one paper. And we will also send around a follow up link um, at the end of the webcast so that you can have the chance to on the one hand side uh, watch the re recording, but on the other hand side, have a look inside our web white paper. And in this term, please enjoy the webcast and I hope you um, yeah, have some valuable insight. Let's hand over. Thank you very much, Dominic, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webcast this morning. I hope you can hear me well as well. 
Um, basically, I'm Alexander Noack. I'm the head of the product center automotive electronics uh, at B Plus in Germany. We're based an hour drive away from Munich um, in the very south, the east corner, I have to say, of, of Germany. Well, basically, shortly introduction, uh, introducing uh, B Plus to you. Uh, we are a company which is uh, 24 years old now, um, mainly focused on engineering around driver assistance, uh, autonomous driving, connect car, control of mobile machines, and all these kind of things, which is mobile topics. Um, we worked a lot with the tier one and OEM customers um, in the last 20 years, and uh, mainly started from camera developments um, around the first uh, AD or ADAS functionalities. Well, we do have 250 employees, mainly engineers, as I said, and the focus uh, basically is on capturing data inside the vehicle. And on the picture, you can see one of those examples, how this kind of uh, setup looks like. It's one of our test vehicles, but uh, I will jump into that topic a little bit deeper um, in a minute. Well, talking about the data garage concept, um, Dominic already introduced that to you. B plus is covering the left part of that, um, the data recording, especially inside the vehicle, up to the point where we hand over the data in the colocation space into the data centers. And uh, this is what we have made in place already. And we, we joined forces with um, all the folks in this uh, call um, because of the reason is that many of our customers working in this area struggled with the loading of data, with handling the data, um, they all have different bits and pieces uh, around that. Um, IT has some issues storing the, the majority of data. And while data explodes basically inside the autonomous drive area, this topic is, is really relevant along the whole chain. And uh, once we look into a little bit deeper, the setup we have at B plus for that topic, um, we look into the sensor equipment of the vehicle and mainly into the topic of uh, recording reliably data time synchronized inside the vehicle and adding as much as possible technology into the test vehicles um, at the very beginning. You can see an ECU on the left part here where we take data from the raw sensor front end, no matter if it's a camera, a radar, or a LiDAR or any other sensor which um, might be used there. We take this data and we put it onto a more generic uh, 10 gigabit ethernet link. Um, we, we have switch components in there in some of the cases, we do even have AI compute platforms inside the vehicle. But the very end at this point is the recording setup inside the vehicle where we capture all the data. Some of the data is going through a gateway to a connected service, um, which helps doing fleet management uh, configurations, find out the sensor setup in the car. Uh, but the majority of data, and you see a small truck in the middle of the slide, um, the majority of data is really physically transported because we talk about terabytes of data, which is not possible through any kind of uh, 5G, 4G, whatever network it is, even wireless LAN is, is kind of very limited to that. Once data is ingested, um, as Dominic mentioned, it went, uh, goes to the data center. Um, a lot of things happening on the server side as well. We will see that in a minute, uh, talking about uh, quality assurance on the data, labeling and all these kind of things. The, all this process is, being necessary for having the right data sets for simulation or for AI training at the end of the day. Well, our part in this uh, proof of concept, as we mentioned, is mainly looking into the vehicle. And this is why I want to introduce the vehicle to you, which we bring into this kind of uh, project. And once we look into that a little bit deeper, we will see that on the next uh, couple of slides. Well, looking into that, the B plus car, uh, which is set up right now, um, looks like um, the next slides will show you that much more in detail. Well, looking into the equipment we have, um, and this is what we see on the, the next slide here, is basically we focused a lot on capturing camera data around the vehicle to get as much as possible visual um, data sets for the sake of AI training at the end of the day or for algorithm development. We put cameras on that because um, the majority of data inside the, our vehicle should be raw data coming from these kind of sensors. And once we look into the raw data amount, we have like um, an overall of a, a bit more than one gigabyte per second in the setup. 
why didn't we do a radar in there? Well, basically, um, radars which we could buy from the market um, to publicly make them available is kind of a can based uh, setup, which um, you can see in other uh, setups over there. But we cannot really interface a raw sensor on a serious um, radar set. This is, and most of that is under NDA. This is why we took as much as possible generic uh, sensors on that. Well, looking into the cameras on the left side, well, they all have some kind of interface, um, which mainly is a raw interface. In our case, it's an FPD link interface on the uh, uppermost cameras. We do have a gigabit ethernet camera in there and two lighters. The lighters physically are connected through gigabit ethernet. Um, some can, of course, is also being captured, but the majority of raw information we get is running through these kind of interface units, which we call measurement data interfaces. So we take the raw data, we put them on 10 gigabit ethernet, and in order to distribute the data properly inside the test vehicle, we added a switch, a switch layer on that in order to route the data to the corresponding units. So when we look into the next step, um, the recording happens to two of our recorders, which we call a brick, uh, we are currently just about today launching the next uh, generation of the, the BRIC systems. You will see that um, in another web um, cast uh, later. Well, once we add a connected system to that, this offers a lot of functionality around fleet management. A lot of uh, meta information can be captured during the test drive and pushed to the cloud, which will then end up as well in the data center. As I mentioned, some of the setups require a compute platform, which means we do some um, AI or algorithm testing inside the vehicle. So we add a server grade um, CPU system in there, which includes also one or two GPUs, um, mainly talking about NVIDIA in this case, in order to compute the, the data right away in the vehicle. Well, and additionally, um, what we put into the car is a very new technology we're offering right now is uh, a central, we call it MD Lake, a mobile data lake system, which uses a lot of the data IT infrastructure, you know, from the data centers. And we can capture um, up to 128 gigabit of data in that simultaneously, and you have one spot for all the storage. In order to use that, um, of course, there's a software layer on top of that which runs across uh, all the systems in order to handle that. So even the uh, recorders are triggered through one single button. They are time synchronized, they are, they are clustered in this kind of um, setup. And the majority of things, and you can see some, uh, some clocks there, all these components need to be time synchronized in order to have a proper understanding of the situation the car is in at a certain moment. Well, once we have captured all that, the crucial part is how do we get that data into the data center? And I said, some of the things are going through the connected services. Um, the majority of data, however, in our proof of concept um, is going into an ingest station and you see a cartridge swapping over there. So basically in these ingest stations, the copy, copy stations, which are based in the co-location center uh, in Frankfurt, we take all this data and we move it into the physical data infrastructure at the data center, which is the next step in this, um, in this presentation. So in this example, uh, once we go further here, we can see that there's a 40 gigabit ethernet link into the, the server infrastructure. It could be, even be extended. It's a very modular system, so we can even um, adjust that to the requirements of specific data centers. And once the data sits on the infrastructure, on the Lenovo servers, as you can see them here, um, you will see what happens there at the next uh, couple of slides. Well, looking into the overall system, um, the system we are providing inside our test vehicle, which is really running um, out there and which is capturing data, is uh, provided by the Avito toolchain we are offering, which is a very modular and future-proof and uh, dedica dedicated to reliable and time-synchronized uh, data capturing um, focus system. Well, that's about it uh, for the introduction of the vehicle and uh, for B+. And uh, I would hand over now uh, to the next speaker. If you want to reach me, just get in touch with me through LinkedIn or also through um, the NTT uh, websites here. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Frank Kramer speaking, IBM Systems Architect. 
And uh, thank you, Alex, for the introduction. And uh, this is the next step in the data chain and uh, getting the data from the car, um, moving it into the data center. The topic from my talk is about uh, the data storing, data storage inside the, inside the collocation data center. And we choose as an interface here, the object storage interface. So let's talk a little bit about the data, the overall data chain. Why is this important? Um, to develop ADAS function, data is, is the most important thing. It, it's about data. And uh, um, what we are doing with the data, uh, other than just uh, getting it out of the car, is we, we have to do analytics, scene selection. We have to do data enrichment and labeling, which Florian will talk later on. We have to do intensive algorithm training then combined with simulation and re-simulation, mostly um, then there's a huge part also using data for validation. The topics here are software in the loop, hardware in the loop, model in the loop, driver in the uh, vehicle in the loop. And at the end, this whole loop will start all over again. And the whole process is about, well, modifying, uh, using, distributing um, data on a large volume basis. And the first part here, and this is uh, why we choose the object storage interface, um, is based on the IBM cloud object storage, which we could see on, on this slide. And uh, um, why IBM costs for ADAS? Um, as you may know, um, um, the previous name of IBM costs uh, was uh, Cleversafe. That's a, sys that's a company from Chicago, which was bought by IBM several years ago. And uh, we use this architecture in order to have a very easy API, a very easy interface in order to get the data from the copy station. Uh, we use the S3 API, which is very, very lightweight, very basic, very usable. It has not the difficulties that typically things like NFS have. And we can scale it very, very easily because we can scale it on an, on a, on an, on an access point. Uh, um, perspective. I show you a little bit that in a second. So we have a very modern architecture here. It's extremely, extremely scalable from very small to very big. We're using to, to store the data. We're using a radio coded machine mechanism in order to drive down the cost. And um, we're using commodity of the shelf, latest generation hard drives, very, very large hard drives, very to, to drive down the costs per gigabyte more or less. Yeah. It has a very simplified management. There's nothing really which is needed when the system is, is, is up and running. And as I said, uh, we're using an S3 API interface. This is the typical interface. The idea um, for IBM Cloud Object so you see it on the right side. Uh, it's using an, an, a slice store. This, so that's, the, that's the piece where the actual data um, is receiving. And on top of that, we need some kind of accessor. This is the HTTP gateway, which is computing the erasure coded mechanism in order to um, write the data and to get the data back more or less. Yeah. But erasure coding is a very typical way. And IBM cloud object storage is very well known. I think most of the Apple users are aware of iCloud. And guess what? iCloud is running on IBM costs. So that's we know it's proven. We know it, get, it can be scaled very, very large. And uh, we can use it in a two different categories. And that's, for us, a very important thing. So um, you can see it on the next uh, slide. Um, we, are, we can use this setup in order to create a, an, an, an on-prem slash colo solution, which can be very, very smartly connected also to the public cloud services. And this is our, let's say, point of view. We think that um, um, for this amount of data, um, collocation and an on-prem uh, on, on ramping of the data is a very, very effective way of driving down the cost and bringing the needed flexibility here. <clears throat> we can have multiple deployment options. It's kind of like what we did now is a single side deployment option in a, in a colo facility. We can also do two sides, geo side, duplicated, replicated, and integration with public cloud services. Also very important is that inside the object storage, we do have um, things like object expiration. So we can delete objects after several um, um, time or when it's not longer needed or, or when we have newer versions, we can trigger events. That means if there's an object 
receiving to the system, we get a new object, we can trigger command chains. That which means we can trigger the next step in the in the in the execution engine. And of course, so we can use, use things like immutable objects. That means we can make objects uh, uh, not deletable, and and that's very important uh, because some of these. Uh, some of the data that we push there uh, has, of course, personal data and and uh, and other very very important things. So we need to treat this very very securely. Okay. Um, on the next chart, um, you see the different way how we could set up these things. As I said in our testing, we're just using a single colo site, yeah, which is I think the most um, single way of doing the doing the imp 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 implementation, and and this is uh, very good for the performance and has uh, some some very nice features from the costing perspective. But we know that as this data is important, we'll probably get into the situation where people will say we need a minimum of two sites in order to have mirroring that if there's if one side is down or there's a failure or a fire or something like that which will never happen in an, in an entity data center but um, um, we need these kind of concepts so we can offer a vault mirroring we can offer three or even more sites that's the default option um, we could use from from the IBM cloud object storage in an on-prem configuration, which means running on your own servers, which will not um, provide any uh, costs um, from, the, from the cloud perspective. And you can read and write as many, as many gigabytes or terabytes a day as you like without driving, uh, driving the costs up more or less. This is the, this is the important thing. Um, what we have in mind, uh, talking about these uh, um, petabytes of storage that will probably need it. Another also very important thing in this area is that we can mix and match on-prem, your own installation with public cloud services. And um, on the next slide, it's very easy to see that we're using the same software on the left side. This is the, the the, the IBM COS image only in color blue. On the right side, this has some more color and this is the cloud model more or less. This is the service. Yeah. You can either um, implement IBM COS uh, as on-prem, private cloud, on your own hardware, running on commodity hardware with, with any kind of um, uh, storage which is supported by this hardware. Um, um, or on the right side, you can say, I don't want to buy my own hardware. I'll, I, will, I, I will consume everything out of, out of a cloud model. And um, as Dominic uh, already told you, NTT is home to the cloud and the IBM cloud specifically in Germany is um, part of the NTT campus. And so the latency and the performance that we can use in order to also integrate IBM public cloud offerings here, running cost storage is also a, valid, a very valid option. Um, talking to integration of cloud services, as we have understood from the beginning, this data has to be stored in a single place, probably in the area where the, where the test drives will happen. But most of the time, the development uh, team in, at the OEMs and tier ones is distributed around the world. So there are people in the US, there are people in Asia, there are people in Europe, and they all need this data and they all need this very, very urgently. And this is the second important thing that we could use object storage very, very efficiently in order to do high-speed VAN transfer. So we can distribute this data with the same protocol, with the same features, with the same functionality around the world using backbones from NTT, using NTT undersea cables, using public cloud infrastructures. Um, though there's no limit, we just have to talk um, uh, TCP IP more or less. And this is very effectively because the protocol is uh, HTTP slash S3 based. Um, we can transfer this very effectively because we are able to combine this with the one accelerator software. IBM has also bought a secondary, a second company called Aspera, which is used for wide area software transfer. It's only a software solution and it's very, very effectively in order to transfer um, uh, cloud data around the world. And as a proof point for that, and uh, that's, uh, uh, you can see it on the, on, on the next slide, we did some, 
some 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 testing, um, transferring twenty uh, a large files, twenty uh, twenty gigabyte files uh, from the US to India using different um, cloud cloud providers, and you can see it it's very very effectively using the same data, it, it makes a difference uh, if you're using smart transfer technology or if you're using just normal tools which are optimized for your LAN environment and are not as let's say, efficient in order to cope with the network, with the WAN latency. Um, and uh, there's also a, a report available. And I think um, um, you see, um, I think distributing data in this area, re receiving data from the car, getting data into the data center and then distributing it it's all over the world in the context of the collocation data center from NTT. I think it's a very, very important topic. And now this data is used for the AI training. And I think AI training is the competence of uh, uh, Florian. And I want to hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Frank, uh, for, uh, for handing over. So yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Florian from Incenda AI. Um, quick intro to, to our company. So um, this is a startup uh, founded in January last year. And our vision is uh, making AI as safe and robust as possible. And how we do that and how we contribute to, uh, uh, to the Data Garage uh, project, um, I will show you guys in the data storage, um, now we are talking about um, data processing. So when you go to the next slide, yeah, um, I would like to um, uh, start with the AI and training data creation process. So all that starts with uh, the specification where the customer is, is uh, writing down the requirements and use cases. and. Uh, based on that, the data is, uh, is collected. For, for data collection, it's really important to gather useful and appropriate data um, because on the next step, the labeling is coming and labeling is really uh, cost intensive and it's a really huge effort. So um, the goal is here to really give data to the labeling that is really enhancing um, the content of the data set. Um, after the labeling, uh, we propose uh, setting up uh, quality assurance um, just to ensure that um, the annotated data is correct um, yeah, based on the specification and that you have a really high uh, quality of the annotated data to have a really high quality data set. And exactly that data set can be used for, for training and truly later on the AI model into the, the productive environment. And especially the, the data collection and the QA, the quality assurance um, are the key business of Incendia AI. And I will uh, have um, more details in the next slide, starting with the data collection. So on the data collection, we are developing an intelligent data collection framework that supports the customer, as already mentioned, to, to collect appropriate and useful data. So how we do that? So if a data set is available, right? Um, we are taking into account what is in the data set and uh, perform um, on the label, on the collected data, edge case detection, and we are, um, let's say, providing a metric um, where you can see how representative the data is. Let's assume you're driving in, in different cities in Europe, but if you are um, collecting or if you give roughly the same data points always to the labeling, to the key, to the data set, the, the, the content of the data set, right, is, is not increasing. So we are providing a metric how you ensure the data set is representative and we are, um, let's say, calculating some, some distances between all the data points and uh, get you, the AI engineers and the data scientists, the hands on and the help which data uh, points are worthful. For the data set or beneficial. Um, additionally to that, um, we are perform data tagging and filtering so that you can search on the data. For example, I would like to have all data points with minimum five cars and uh, three pedestrians, right? And, and here 
we give guidance um, to the IO developers or engineers and to the data scientists what are useful and appropriate data points to the labeling. So this is, this is our goal here. Um, and uh, the other point is um, the goal is to be to have really a fast selection for the label. How that is uh, working, we, are, we will see on the next slide. So, yeah, um, from an input um, perspective, uh, we can read uh, the data directly from a sensor, or we can run in a data recorder or directly, or um, we get the data from, from the cloud storage. We have a data interest there. Um, optional, we have a data conversion if it's necessary to adapt to our input, input specification of our intelligent data collection algorithms. And um, then as an as a output of that algorithms, as an example, you see on the right uh, side, so we have uh, annotations on that picture. For example, we have cars, we have a truck, we have traffic signs. Um, and based on, on that, um, let's say annotations or metadata, you can search on the data. For example, give me all the pictures with, in that case, uh, three cars and, and minimum and maybe one truck. Right, and then you can select this this, this data points uh, for for the labeling. Uh, this is uh, not only working for camera data. This is uh, yeah, working for any visual sensor, lidar, uh, radar, um, ultrasonic, and uh, this concept is working for single points and uh, sequences as well. Uh, for sure, if we are running in the cloud, so we have more compute power available. So we can reach with, with our algorithms uh, really huge accuracy. If there is a requirement to run directly on the data logger, so we have to decrease the accuracy a bit, we need to save uh, compute power. So that, that is really scalable and depends on, on the requirements um, from, from our customers. Yeah, uh, then we have selected really good data for the labeling. And um, yeah, the labeling is normally done by other companies. So this is not the core business of Vincenda. We see on the next slide um, uh, what is coming after labeling, right? So yeah, uh, the customer is, is providing the data to, to the labeling companies. They are doing the labeling. And then um, our software regarding quality assurance is coming in place. So this is a different tool set compared to the intelligent data collection. And we are doing auto checks and we have a visual inspection, inspection on all the data points and performing a quality assurance according to the annotation specification, right? And um, what we have seen in projects that we have many uh, spec violations, for example, then the bounding boxes have the correct size or um, some, some uh, cars or the pedestrians are overlooked in the, um, in the image data. And then uh, we mark that and provide feedback to the labeling companies and they have the possibility to, to correct this. Um, on the next iteration, we see on the slide, yeah, on the second iteration, when the data is coming back from the labeling company, we do the, the check again and see if all this, this stuff is corrected. And if, if the issues are, are corrected, so we provide a report, we provide all the high quality annotated data to the customer and the customer can generate a really high quality um, and a correct data set that can be used for training. And um, yeah, from our point of view, as a conclusion that we see on the next slide, um, we definitely need a high quality data set for training and how we can get this. Two important points must be fulfilled for getting that. First of all is we have to collect uh, appropriate and useful data. So we have the right content in the data set. This is, can be done by our intelligent data collection framework. The next thing is when we have collected the correct data, this must be labeled. And after the labeling, um, there must be a quality assurance really to have correct and proper annotated data. So this is our data quality assurance business. And with that two points, um, there is the possibility to get a high quality data set used for training. And this is an enable for a safe and reliable AI. 
yeah, that was it from my side. So um, if you have questions, you can reach me by mail or uh, LinkedIn. And uh, exactly this kind of intelligent data collection framework um, will, or is integrated in the Data Garage project. Um, yeah, so looking forward to your questions. And then I hand over to Carsten, and he is talking about how we can calculate all this kind of algorithms. Yeah, hello, my name is Carsten Kutzer. I'm working for the Lenovo Data Center Group as an HPC, High Performance Computing and AI, Artificial Intelligence Architect. So what I'm doing in my daily life is designing huge systems that are computing massive amounts of data, like petabytes of data, gigabytes per second, and getting useful information from, from that data. Lenovo is probably well known to most people here in, in the call because uh, of the ThinkPads. What a lot of people don't know actually is that Lenovo also has this data center group with servers, with storage. And actually that business was acquired by Lenovo from IBM in 2015. So there's already some history and background uh, behind our division. Uh, it, it's nothing new uh, in, in that respect. Okay, let's, let's go on, on where we are in the process. So uh, we just heard how data is stored from a software perspective, how it's processed uh, also from a software perspective, up, but in, in the end, everything needs to run on some kind of hardware. So the expectation sometimes is, okay, the, the data is in the data center, and that's now something like a cloud. But uh, what, what is a cloud in, in the end? Um, can, can you switch to the next slide, please? Yeah, so data center and, and cloud is sometimes seen somewhat synonymously. So it's, it's something, cloud is an experience that we get in our daily life when we're looking at our smartphones and storing photos. And that's it's something that's working in the background and we just expect that it's working and we don't take a lot of care about why it's working at all. But uh, when you're in the data center looking at what, what the actual hardware is doing, you of course have to, to look at the details as well. So let's look at the details, how the d data that's coming from the in vehicle recording stuff via cartridge into the data center. Next slide, please. Um, but, but maybe one, one step back, sorry. <laughs> one slide back, okay. Yeah, so uh, there, there's one thing that we have to discuss on, on this side as well. There is a perception that public cloud is, is cloud. Like, okay, we have the, the big names in that space like Amazon, like uh, Microsoft with Azure, uh, or even telecom cloud here in Germany. But that, that's not really the definition of cloud. What's behind cloud by its, its core is that it's a delivery and consumption model from a user perspective. So the user wants to have on-demand services and get quickly some virtual servers up and running, some storage up and running so that he can do whatever he needs to do in a very quick and efficient way. From a uh, provider perspective, it's more like an IT operation model. And that operation model needs to be able to adapt to changing requirements very quickly and efficiently to really support what, what it's supposed to do for the end users. Um, a very, very often used model is nowadays going to private clouds because public clouds, they have advantages, but also disadvantages. A lot of customers are deploying their own private cloud environment for several reasons. And that reason can be cost efficiency, that can be security, that can be regulatory uh, concerns. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's just a good idea to have the core business on a private, private cloud environment running your base workloads, your day-to-day -day work. And then when, whenever you need it, you can uh, use a public uh, cloud and combine that with a private cloud to, to a model of a hybrid cloud. We saw that with IBM cloud object storage, that's a relatively easy thing to do for, on, on the data side. And that's also true for uh, the, the software applications. So bursting out to, to public clouds when you have peak demands, when you have unexpected workloads, that's something that's uh, often used today. Okay, now really going back to, to the hardware. 
So we, we saw that we have in vehicle recording on the left hand side, we see that we get the cartridges, they get moved over to the data center, they're loaded into the cloud object storage, which is running on storage rich servers. And then we have some AI processing capabilities. Nowadays, often uh, GPU rich servers are used for AI processing because uh, for, for training processes, GPUs uh, seem to be very, very efficient. Um, in general, uh, the, the standard Intel or AMD CPUs, of course, can also do that part, but the trend is really going to GPU servers for that. On the right hand side, you see uh, in, in the end, there's an engineer working with the results that whatever the AI processing does. So you usually have a workstation there. If you want to uh, run your AI model that you derive from the training in a uh, small inference uh, environment on a workstation. But not all the users have uh, the big workstations on their side. And sometimes you have traveling mobile workers that only have a notebook, a laptop, and they also want to have that full GPU power behind it. So you can use uh, remote desktop environments in the data centers with powerful GPUs that drive actually the workload and that just have the representation on a more lightweight notebook on the outside. Um, on the left hand side, what we also see is that there's an option and that's not really reflected or part of this data garage project, but it's a, a look beyond that. That's edge pre-processing. So you could imagine that uh, from the car that's recording the data, you get some very interesting pieces of data that you want to process relatively quickly. So you can send it over an LTE network to some edge pre-processing devices that have that network connectivity, but that also have the power to have GPU AI acceleration to do some pre-processing on the data before you actually store it into the cloud directly. And uh, usually it's, it's desired to have a full level of support and service from, from one partner to cover the whole process chain. That will allow you to, to yeah, really make sure that the whole chain works as it should without having to interfere with different partners at the infrastructure side. So why do we think Lenovo is a good partner for you? So uh, when we're looking at the next slide, you can see that, uh, as I mentioned, I'm working for the high performance computing and AI business. And we as Lenovo are very proud to be the leading provider of high performance computing systems in the world. So we have a, a number one in aggregate performance back in November 2019. Roughly a third of the uh, 500 fastest uh, supercomputers are provided by Lenovo. So we have some experience here. And that experience we actually share with our customers as well. So we know how to tune the systems. We know to get, uh, how to get best performance from storage and also from, from compute systems. On the next slide, you will see another thing that, that's important. You want to make sure that your hardware infrastructure runs very smoothly all the time. Of course, the upper level software will cover a lot of issues that you could have in the hardware. But in the end, any hardware issue will result at least in less performance, and sometimes if it's going too far, then you can actually lose your service. Um, and we are very proud as Lenovo to have very, very good references. Here's the ITIC uh, report, which uh, told us that we are actually the best among all Intel server providers for the last seven years with respect to availability of the systems. On the final slide, <laughs> We uh, are looking also at, at something, but what's also important from, from a hardware partner perspective is you want to have a partner that's looking forward, who's not just looking at today's technology, but looking on what's coming and uh, who can innovate on, on whatever is required. And when you're looking at uh, CPUs and GPUs, the power consumption of those uh, pieces of hardware will increase to more than 300 watts in the next couple of years. And it's really a big challenge to cool that kind of power density in a very dense system. And that's something that we are really uh, leading the, the pack at, at Lenovo with the history back in 2012 where we developed uh, direct water cooled systems. And we are extending that also to GPU systems. And there has been some recent very nice uh, announcements on 
two big sites in, in Germany that, that are yeah, benefiting from, from that new technology that's coming up. Okay, that, that's it actually from my side. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for the very interesting insights. Uh, I hope that every one of the attendees also uh, yeah, enjoyed the, the talks and gained some uh, deeper uh, knowledge of uh, the Data Garage project and how we can solve the data challenge in autonomous driving. When I'm logging into the chat, uh, there are no questions coming up that uh, yeah, can, can have the reason that we already answered all the questions already in our talks. Um, if not, um, please don't hesitate to, to write us. Uh, also afterwards, um, as I said, we will send around the follow-up email uh, in the upcoming days. You will receive the recording of uh, the whole webcast as well as the slides and uh, our white paper around the whole project. So uh, thanks a lot for attending. Um, we will save the time and wish you a great day. Goodbye.